mentioned earlier this evening about their new capital, which will be located in the center of the country, uh, carved from territories of three major regions, uh, much on the model of our own experience in Washington. In any case, many people do see Nigeria, of course, as an experiment in federalism. Other people are struck by Nigeria, uh, by its importance in the world today to North-South relations, the importance to the United States uh, with respect to the immediate question of oil. Nigeria is the second largest exporter of oil to the United States after Saudi Arabia. Um, and many people think of Africa uh, as Ni of Nigeria as being especially critical to the development of the African continent. And some people foresee a future for Nigeria as a great power in the 21st century. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, the ambassador from Nigeria has agreed to meet with us. The ambassador was educated in Nigeria uh, in his early schooling, and in fact remarked this evening about his university education being one of 28 students in their only university. I was tempted to originally remark that he had been a, received his higher education in Nigeria, but that would not have been a vivid enough statement of his, his actual experience. Uh, he has also received an academic diploma uh, in education from the University of London, and he studied international relations at Queen's College, Oxford University. Uh, his career in the service of his state has been extensive. Uh, let me only very briefly mention a few of the positions which he has held in order to give you a, a, a flavor of, of his experience. Um, he's been, uh, he's held positions in Madrid. Um, he served, of course, in his foreign ministry in Lagos. He served in London, in Zaire, uh, in the Federal Republic of Germany as ambassador to that state, as ambassador to Liberia. He's been director of the European De uh, Affairs Department in the Ministry of External Affairs in Lagos. He was a delegate to the Commonwealth Conference in, in Jamaica. He's been a member of the Nigerian delegation in bilateral talks with the Soviet Union. He's been director of administration the of the administration and finance department in the Ministry of External Affairs and a member of the Nigerian delegation to the United Nations General Assembly before becoming, in 1977, ambassador to the United States. He's agreed to talk with us this evening about Nigeria's place in the world, its place in Africa, its present and future, and Nigerian-American relations. It's a great deal of, it gives me a great deal of pleasure on behalf of our Board of Trustees to welcome this evening uh, the Ambassador of Nigeria to the United States, His Excellency Olajumi Jalioso. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to uh, thank the Baltimore Council on Foreign Relations for inviting me to be with you tonight and to share some of my thoughts about the bilateral relations between the United States and Nigeria and what we in Nigeria are trying to do on the continent of Africa. Um, I was rather taken aback at the very positive and uh, big things that um, Dr. Kurt said about Nigeria being a power in Africa and in the world. I think what we are trying to do is and to contribute as much as our resources allow us to the betterment of uh, that mass of land that used to be called the Dark Continent. We, I think I'm going to limit myself primarily to our role in Africa and the relations between Nigeria and the United States in order to serve as a framework for whatever the discussions may follow later. 
um, in October of last year, President Shehu Shagari of the Federal Republic of Nigeria came to New York to address the United Nations General Assembly. On that occasion, he was invited to pay an official visit to Washington by the President of the United States. It was the second official visit of a Nigerian Chief of State to the White House in three years. And during that period also, the President of the United States had paid an official visit to Nigeria, making him the first United States President to visit Africa officially. These exchanges were signs of a relatively new cordiality in the relations between our two countries. For this has not always been the case. There had indeed been a time when a Nigerian chief of state came to the United Nations to address the assembly. And in spite of our very best efforts, we could not secure an invitation for him to visit the White House because the then president was spending his weekend in San Clemente. There was also a time when the Secretary of State of the United States could not obtain a visa to visit Nigeria. In other words, we have come a very long way in a very short time to the present. A present in which it was it is possible for President Ronald Reagan to write to President Shehu Shagari on taking office, and I quote, I am delighted to be entering office at a time when the United States-Nigeria relations are cooperative and cordial, unquote. In order to understand the positive development, to understand this positive development in our bilateral relations, we must examine the dynamics of those relations. Basically, these relations are determined by an interplay of our respective foreign policy objectives, both explicit and implicit. In this country, for example, any discussion of your foreign policy invariably turns to a consideration of your ideological position relative to that of the Soviet Union. Your stand against the Soviet Communist plan to dominate the world and your national security objectives. Therefore, your relations with most of us in the developing world are determined by your perception of our position on the ideological spectrum and how vital we are to your national security interests. In fact, that has become very obvious in the foreign policy pronouncements of the present United States administration. <coughs> On our side, each succeeding administration since we became independent in 1960 has maintained and demonstrated the basic principle that Africa is a cornerstone of Nigeria's foreign policy. Although there have been variations in, the, in emphasis in the way in which different administrations in Nigeria have tried to give expression to this fundamental principle, depending on issues at hand, we have been consistently faithful to it. Indeed, the writers of our present constitution did consider it fit and proper to spell out the foreign policy objectives of the nation as follows, and I quote, the state shall promote African unity 
as well as total political, economic, social and cultural liberation of Africa and all other forms of international cooperation conducive to the consolidation of universal peace and mutual respect and friendship among all peoples and states and shall combat racial discrimination in all its manifestations. End of quote. A dimension inherent in the foregoing enunciation of our foreign policy objective, which is not quite explicit but has been developed over the years, is that Nigeria is truly non aligned in its pursuit of that universal peace and mutual respect and friendship among all peoples and all nations. The late Prime Minister of Nigeria, Sir Abubakar Kafar Balewa, on the floor of Parliament in Lagos on the 16th of August 1960, on the eve of independence, in enunciating the tenets of the foreign policy of Nigeria, stated at the time that we would be truly non-aligned, that we would not, as a matter of course, belong to any ideological bloc. He explained that we would consider every subject on its own merit and come to our own conclusions on them. I do not think that anyone has deviated from that ever since. Our main preoccupation as a developing country, therefore, is neither ideological nor military. We are dedicated to achieve those conditions that will permit the total development of our people within Nigeria and in other parts of Africa. We wish to use our internal strength and resources to this end, whatever it takes. And we know that it will take the maintenance of friendly relations with other nations. We know that it will not take subservience to any ideological posture. It will require mutual respect and interdependence and so long as we respect each other's dearly held principles and do not needlessly hurt each other's susceptibilities, so long as we do not attempt to coerce or intimidate others to lean to our point of view, we are sure to achieve this goal. We will cooperate with others in our search for that international peace and security, consulting on and consolidating the areas of agreement and seeking to narrow the areas in which we differ. As people with a colonial history, our goal is to help in the total liberation and decolonization of all parts of Africa. And as the largest black country in the world, it is our purpose to achieve respect and dignity for the black person everywhere in the world. It is in the light of the foregoing examination that one can see how the health of our bilateral relations with the United States has varied from very poor sometimes to very good at other times. During the Kennedy years, relations were reasonably good, for as a developing country that needed the skills and resources of your advanced technological development, we received substantial support from your government. An example of that substantial support was the Peace Corps program, which had a tremendous impact on our people. In a succeeding administration, which coincided unfortunately with the period when we suffered an internal upheaval and a civil war which sought to tear our country apart, elements within 
the American legislature and in the country at large saw to it that the federal government received little or no aid from the government of the United States. The special interest lobbies, some of them interested in human rights and others in order to promote their religious connections, ensured that in our time of greatest need, it was the so-called underdog. It was the rebellion within our body politic that received both the sympathy and the help of the majority of the American people. We sought to purchase military hardware for cash from the United States, but were turned down by the administration. We were constrained to go to seek other sources from which to purchase the hardware needed to fight to for and to preserve the unity and integrity of our nation. That alternative source at the time was the Soviet Union. Fortunately, Nigeria was in a position to pay cash and nothing else for that help. The moral here is twofold. Firstly, it is like when you forbid two young lovers to see each other. All you do is drive them together and then they elope and get married. The second moral here is that those countries fighting either for their independence or for survival with little or no resources of their own appreciate prompt and appropriate assistance irrespective of the ide ideological origin of such a help. If they must pay for it in ideological conversion and commitment then they will. But that is the privilege which they will exercise when they have achieved their primary goal. There are some countries in our part of the world today which have found themselves in the latter category. The former chief of state of Nigeria, General Olusegun Obasanjo, once described these countries as an example of a failure of Western coloni colonialism in Africa, that if they had been prepared for independence and given the sense of security that they needed, there would have been no reason for them in the first instance to flirt with the East. It is not so long ago that any mention by the media and the Congress of Mr. Robert Mugabe and his compatriots fighting for Zimbabwe's independence regularly referred to them as Marxist-oriented or communist-backed. Many Americans fail to recognize the fact that these men of courage were more interested in ridding themselves of one foreign yoke and were not in a hurry to submit to another willingly. Their ready acceptance of aid and weapons to enable them to achieve their goal was obvious. It was only thereafter that alliances were revealed. Experience has shown that when that review ended, the result was pragmatism. The freedom fighters and note, I call them freedom fighters, not terrorists, were nationalists in the first instance. But many people in the Western world have labeled them as communist terrorists. Now, after digressing somewhat, let me come back to trace uh, the history of our bilateral relations. The Nixon Ford administration was a period of cool relationships because those administrations, in our judgment, gave succor to Portuguese colonialism in Angola and Mozambique 
and to the white minority regimes in then Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, and above all, to South Africa. The Kizinga Auction 309, which sought to legitimize the white minority regime in Rhodesia, was one great irritant in those relationships. You can then understand why the visa was not forthcoming. By this time, our revenue from the export of oil to this and other countries had made the United States Agency for International Development decide that Nigeria had reached the graduate status and therefore needed no aid from the United States. So the aid mission closed its offices in Nigeria. However, and I have to be very careful at this point, when the Carter administration came into power, the relationships warmed up considerably. It is not my intention to extol the virtues of any one administration in this country over those of another. But the truth is that it was the Carter administration which for the first time tried to identify African issues in and of themselves as important and to be addressed as such. That administration also seemed to understand that in order to, be, uh, to reap the benefits of American-African interdependence politically, economically, and in other ways, it was necessary to be sensitive to, the, to our points of view without necessarily succumbing to them. Relations were such that sufficient cognizance was taken of some of our aspirations, such as our efforts at peaceful settlement of problems created by the minority racist regimes in Southern Africa. Africa and Africans were not seen merely as a factor in the zero-sum game between the East and the West, between the Soviet Union and the United States. Consequently, there were increased economic, cultural, and political cooperation between the United States and Nigeria. We cooperated in successfully decolonizing Zimbabwe and came very close to doing the same for Namibia. We consulted very closely on global issues at the United Nations. Nigeria became a major and critical trading partner of the United States, and we have received major cooperation in expanding programs geared towards the transfer of some of your high technology into our developing economy, depending, of course, on our own resources. It is our hope that we can, with the new United States administration, not only maintain the present cordial relations between our two countries, but that we can also improve on them. One can only express a hope at this point in time, because whether jointly or severally, I and my African colleagues in the Diplomatic Corps in Washington, and therefore obviously, our various governments have been assured by the Reagan administration that there is an ongoing active review of the United States policy on Africa. Normally, we would await the outcome of such a review, study the resultant new position, and develop our own attitudes accordingly. That would have been the normal procedure, the normal sequence of events. However, while the review is in progress, we have seen certain seemingly irreversible steps 
being taken within the framework of the United States African policy. We can therefore almost predict what the final policy will be from the trend which has become discernible in the last few weeks. Because of the campaign promises of the present administration, as soon as the administration was installed, the United Nations Conference on Namibia, which was being held in Geneva between January 5 and 12, aimed at bringing a peaceful solution to the Namibian independence problem, was promptly aborted by the government of South Africa. This was obviously because of the encouraging signs from the new administration, which were perceived by South Africa as supportive of its racist policy of apartheid. And that was about the third time that the South African government had led the negotiators in this exercise up the garden path. At the end of January, South African troops moved into and raided Mozambique, killing several people on the excuse of attacking the hideouts of communist terrorists. The whole world condemned that aggression in very strong terms. But from all we could gather, the best or the most appropriate adjective that the administration could muster was, quote, unfortunate. South African military intelligence chiefs came to this country and were received officially by the U.S. Ambassador at the United Nations. Yet another signal to South Africa that things are changing. We hear very often that South Africa is a friend and ally of the United States. We hear that there are many people within South Africa who are working for a change in the apartheid policy of the government and that therefore South Africa merits both the attention and the cooperation of the United States. It also produces certain strategic minerals required by the United States. We can of course only conclude that the United States still regards South Africa as more important in the context of its perceived strategic importance in the East-West rivalry. More important than in the context of its unacceptable policy relative to the African majority in that country and the dignity of the black person in the other countries of Africa. We find it difficult to understand that a review which is expected to be open-ended is indeed in progress when on March the 3rd the President himself said among other things, and I quote, as long as there is a sincere and honest effort being made to do away with the racial separatist policies, we should be trying to be helpful. Can we again take the other course? Can we abandon a country that has stood by us in every war we have ever fought, a country that is strategically essential to the free world in its production of minerals that we all must have, end of quote. We are not very sure that sincere efforts are being made in South Africa to end apartheid. So we see this not as part of a new um, policy, but something already defined. We see it also as a confirmation of the support and indication of encouragement to that country and its reversible stance, which no review can alter. Again, 
towards the end of the Carter administration, there were those in Congress who tried to repeal the Clark Amendment, which prohibits covert activities by the United States CIA in Angola. At that time, when some of us protested to the administration at the attempt to repeal the amendment, we were informed that the administration never sought nor had any intention to use the powers that would be released to it by the repeal of that law. We, however, pointed out that the timing of the effort was inauspicious because of the role which Angola was playing in our negotiations to decolonize Namibia, that it would send the wrong signals to South Africa, to the Angolans, and to the rest of us in Africa. Now we hear the same demand for the repeal of the amendment, but from a different direction and in more strident notes. It is from the administration itself, because it wishes to use this freedom to support Savimbi's UNITA and to overthrow the so-called communist MPLA government and get the Cubans out of Angola. We hold no briefs at all for either the Russians or the Cubans, but the signal is clear to us. Does the new administration wish to collaborate with South Africa, condoning apartheid and racism in spite of the worldwide condemnation of that philosophy of government? Does the United States wish to sponsor and assist UNITA, a terrorist group, I repeat, to overthrow a government recognized by all the members of the Organization of African Unity? It will be very difficult for us, for any African country, and that includes Nigeria, to resist the temptation to conclude that the reviewed African policy of the United States is meant to permit the government of this country to range itself on the same side as the immoral and outcast government of South Africa against the legitimate aspirations of an African country, frustrating its efforts to consolidate its independence by whatever means it finds available to it. The Angolans themselves will see it particularly with their experience of South African incursions and invasions as a determination on the part of the U.S. government to bring them down. It would be logical for them to be less cooperative in the search for a peaceful solution to the problems in Namibia. That kind of situation can lead not only to a continuation of the war in that country, but also to an intensification of unrest in the whole of the southern region of our continent, with all the undesirable effects attached to it. Surely, this cannot be the intention of either the Congress or the administration. Many of us in Africa who regard ourselves as friends of the United States are truly non-aligned. We will see this not just as a United States effort to contain communism worldwide and to curb the so-called Soviet and Cuban adventurism in Africa. But we will see it as giving succor to the forces of racism and oppression and prolonging our travails. The Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Designate, is currently traveling in Africa, sounding the views of African leaders before an African policy is formally fashioned out and presented to us. We hope that that policy will lead to a recognition of the need to identify 
and respect African and Nigerian points of view and a willingness on the administration's part to discuss differences with us where they exist. We hope it will lead to a readiness to work with us for a peaceful solution of the South African uh, problem by exerting sufficient pressure, economic and otherwise, on the government of that country to relinquish its illegal hold on Namibia and to set a timetable for a change in its obnoxious apartheid policy. For to the degree to which black Africans on our continent are treated as less than human, to that degree do we regard ourselves objects of racial discrimination and oppression on our own continent. To that degree also do we regard our independence curtailed and restricted. In sum, let me share with you the words of President Shehu Shagari when he was in the White House last October, and I quote, We in Nigeria do not regard our independence as complete as long as there remains a parcel of land on the African continent which is still under foreign domination, nor shall we rest in our fight so long as racism and racial discrimination is a philosophy of government as practiced on our continent. But may I ask you, Mr. President, to let us work more closely and more diligently together to eradicate this evil which the international community has declared abominable. It is our hope that your administration and the entire American people who have purged racism from your own society by law will collaborate with us in doing the same by your votes at the United Nations in the case of our continent. Financial gains have only temporary advantage for those who condone apartheid to protect their profits. In the long run, when apartheid collapses, as it surely will, these investments will be in jeopardy. It is best to heed the voice of reason now and work for a peaceful change than to wait to be engulfed in a violent upheaval. End of quote. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your comprehensive and forthright statement. The Ambassador has agreed to answer questions, as is our custom, uh, until about 10 minutes after 9, and we'll end uh, promptly. Yes, please. Soon the land of the Israeli Arab War, the Arabs use their oil as a bargaining labor. Of course, European nations are not to get paid through Israel. Do you expect the um, nation of Spain to plan to use oil as a leverage to persuade the United States to modify the policy towards South Africa? Now, let me be very careful about this. Um, because I ran into hot water about this only a short while ago. <laughs> When President Shagari was visiting uh, the United States last year, he addressed the Foreign Policy Association in New York. And the questioner posed this same question to him. And I think also in an interview on television, the same question was posed. And on both occasions, his answer was, yes, we will if we think it is necessary. Now, I didn't say it. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last question. If I repeat the 
Union to get me. Would you care to comment on Nigeria's relations with the President of the Dutch and the Muslim? Well, um, we let me back up a little. When the government, when the state of Israel occupied a part of Egypt, we, as a member of the Organization of African Unity, resolved that as long as that part of Egypt, which was part of Africa, was occupied by conquest, we were not going to maintain good relations with um, Israel. This was a decision of all the members of the Organization of African Unity. It was arrived at after a long debate at which the Egyptian delegates made impassioned pleas to us, to the members of the organization, to stand by them. Quite a few of the Africans were therefore not a little surprised when certain events occurred on the South Lawn or the White House here, and they were hearing of it for the first time. And this has colored, therefore, the relationships between Egypt and a lot of even the African countries. But to answer more directly the bilateral relations between Egypt and Nigeria, we have maintained good relations with Egypt. Uh, our view, and this permeates also our view, our, our stance in, on many African issues, it's those who are closest to the fire who know the heat. And they know why they've done this. It's like, I'm sure someone's going to throw the question at me here. What do you expect those countries that trade and do business with South Africa to do? What, how are you related? I mean, what's your relationship with them? And I always cite the examples of Desoto and uh, Botswana who are enclaves in South Africa. We are not asking them to commit political suicide or economic suicide either. So that's uh, our relations, I mean our stance with Egypt. Yes, sir. Uh, you've spoken at some length, Mr. Ambassador, about 